mandar el audio por este momento. Donc, j'ai lancé le Zoom pour Weichao. Suspendre le téléenregistreur. To introduce the. Sorry. Okay. Uh, the introduce the quantum probability. Uh, okay. And today I will introduce the quantum probability theory and some quantum stochastic precise, just the Wiener precise and the Poisson precise. And the beginning, I will give some reference. I will, the principle, I will follow the, the articles of Luke Bouton, Van Handel, and James articles, the an introduction to the quantum filtering to introduce the quantum probability theory. And also, there we, maybe we will need some functional analysis. And the last one is a very good book reference. And for the traditional the treatment, if we want to measure uh, an observable, uh, observable, which means it's a self-adjunct operator, and we always focus on the, this observable on some Hilbert space, and we're given some, we'll give some density operator if the pure state is just a, a vector. And we can, we can obtain the probability by this, by this expression, and we can also calculate expectation for some observable by this one. And of course, we can generalize this expression to a site of commutative observables. And this, this book, this lecture note, uh, is a very good reference for this part of, of job. But the problem is, is not enough for our final purpose. Our final purpose is to derive a quantum filtering. We want to obtain a stochastic master equation which can describe the time evolution of open consistent, the state of open consistent. So if we just, uh, at this level, if the quantum probability is not enough, we need to make some generalization. generalization. Uh, so by the classical treatment, we want, to, we want to define something like the quantum analogs of sigma algebra or the federation in the classical probability. And the second objective is to want to obtain, want to uh, obtain some transformation mechanism between observables and random variable in the classical case, in the classical random variable, because we always talk the observables is a random quantum random variable, but what is the relation between the, the uh, between the observables, the self-adjunct operators, and random variable, random variables. And of course, we want to define, we need some, some set of all the observables. And firstly, I will okay, introduce some definitions. The first one is star algebra uh, on the fixed hyperspace. And here we, we need some, we focus our uh, algebras on the hyperspace. And normally for the more general definition, we don't need fixed uh, hyperspace, but here, is enough for our level of problem. So here's the definition for star algebra on the hyperspace. A star algebra on H is a collection of linear operators on this hyperspace containing the identity, identities such that the first one is, is closed, the linearity closed, which means if A and B belong to this collection and for adding uh, complex constant and we have this linear combination is also can be found in this collection. The second one is closed by multiplications, which means A and B belong to the, this collection and AB belong to this collection. And also it's closed by the involution. It's a star, okay, we do know about the involution by star, which means it's A belong to this collection and a star belong to this collection. And for such collection of linear operators, on hyperspace H, we call this collection a star algebra. Okay. And if for any state, any two states commute with each other, 
and we call these collections, this star algebra, is commutative. And next, we need to define a state on this star algebra. And the state on this star algebra is just a functional. And this functional is linear, which means satisfy this expression. And also positive, which means for any positive element, A, in the star algebra, and we have the functional, sorry, we have this, uh, the state of A is always positive. This is called positive property. And we, we need also the normalization, which means the, this functional of identity is equal to one. Okay, it's a good choice for the, to describe the, the observables of the quantum system, but it's not enough. And then we need to also add some additional conditions on such algebra and state in order to describe the, our quantum system in a probabilistic framework. So for the first one, we, I need to introduce the Fundamental Algebra. It's also where we, we focus on the way we give of hyperspace. And the Fundamental Algebra on the hyperspace H, hyperspace H is a star. Sub-algebra is all the abundant operators on the hyperspace H, and which contains the identities and is strongly closed. That normally for the common the Fundamental Algebra, we, we normally we write the weakly closed, but in fact, these two are the same, it's equivalent. So here, it just for some direct sense, intuition I write is like, like the strongly closed, okay? So it's a definition for the fundamental algebra. And also, we need uh, just a state that's not enough if it works on some infinity uh, hyperspace. So I need add some supplement conditions for the state. The, if the state is called faithful, which means the state of a star and a equal to zero, we can obtain the a equal to zero. The second one is the more important one, is normal. So if I have this expression for all bounded increasing knot, a alpha. And in fact, the normal of the state, the state in fact plays a role as a probability measure for classical, in the, in the counterpart of classical probability theory. And the normal of the state is something close to the countable adaptive addition, countable addition for the, the probability measure. And without surprise, we give a definition of a quantum probability space. Quantum probability space is the pi for the A as a fundamental algebra, and we gave uh, always on the hyperspace at a normal state on this fundamental algebra. And here we, we need, the two things we need to remark is first of all, the algebra need to be fundamental algebra, and for the state need to be normal. And we can, there's a two quantum example in the papers of an introduction to the quantum filtering. Maybe in the section three, we state two quantum examples. For the first one, if uh, algebra is not fundamental algebra, uh, it cannot uh, relate it corresponds to a classical, classical probability space. And for the second one, if the state is not normal one, and it's also some problems to relate it this probability space to the classical probability space. So, I mean, these two uh, properties for the fundamental algebra and the normal state is very important. And next the proposition, I can state that for the classical, our quantum probability space is more general definition. Um, and a classical probability space is just a special case of quantum probability space. For example, if we have a, a classical quantum, uh, sorry, classical probability space, and we can define uh, fundamental algebra by the is a collection of all uh, bounded uh, functions on this space as a works at a x, x at a multiplication operator on this L two space, 
and this space is commutative, of course. And with, we define the state by this expression, it is a normal state. Okay, so by this proposition, we can see exactly the classical property space is just a special case. And I will not give the proof, we can find the proof in this lecture note of Marston's lecture note in the quantum probability. Normally, just the proposition 1.1. Here is an example of uh, quantum probability space. And next is how to construct, how to construct the quantum sigma algebra, which, is, which means it is just a von Neumann algebra. How to construct the von Neumann algebra. And here I want to introduce two notations. First, the one is called self-adjoint site S, which means if any operators in this collection is site S and is a joint is also can be found in this site. And for such site, it's called self-adjoint site. And uh, for second one, it's very important, is commutant of this site, which means is uh, the site of all operators, bounded operators, which commute with the site, any, uh, any state, uh, sorry, any of the operators in this site. Okay. Which means the any uh, operators in this uh, in the commit commutant of S uh, commute with any operators in the S. Okay, and here is a very important theorem, which is called double commutant theorem, which gives us a lot of information to how to construct a fundamental algebra. Let S let, uh, be a self-adjoint set, and is the subset of the bounded operator on H. Self-adjoint uh, definitions here. And then we uh, then the A we define A and the double commutant. Double commutant is we do uh, two times, okay? We calculate the commutant of S and then we continue to ca calculate the commutant of the commutant of S, which is called double commutant. And they can show that the double commutant of S is the smallest von Neumann algebra contain this site. It's very powerful tools. And in particular, if a set is von Neumann algebra, if and only if this set B equals to its double commutant. Okay, and we can find the proof of the theorem, for example, here in this book, this uh, classical book, very famous book of the theory of operator algebras. Uh, just by straight corollaries, we can obtain, we can define the von Neumann algebra generated by a set S which is given by this definition, which means well, the, this site, this site maybe is not self-adjoint. So we, we just uh, uh, take the union of its adjoint. Adjoint is which the, all the sites of adjoint in this S. And we calculate the double commutant, calculate double commutant of this union. And we can obtain the smallest fundamental algebra, which contains this union. And this, this this uh, this site is called von Neumann algebra, generated by this site. And also we have uh, some important result, an interesting result. If given a commuting site of observables, observables is self-adjunct operators, okay. And a set of commuting observables, X, and uh, the von Neumann algebra generated by this site is the commutative von Neumann algebra. And this is very easy to prove. If this site is commutative, which means they is commute between each other, of course, this site belongs to his commutant, okay? Because this commutant contains all the operators commute with the and the operator in the X. And this is, this is trivial, okay? And we continue to calculate the double commutant of X because in this 
in the commutant of x, it contains the x. So we can easily show that the double commutant of x is just a subset of the commutant of x, x commutant of x. And we have also these properties for any site when the commutant of this site is equal to the three times commutant. So which means we can obtain the, the double commutant is a subset of a triple commutant of x, which means the double commutant is commutative. Okay, so uh, the fundamental algebra generated by the x is commutative. We have already showed the uh, quantum probability space and how to how to obtain, how to contrast, uh, how to construct uh, fundamental algebra by some given observables. For example, if you want to observe some observables and based on this observable, we can construct a community fundamental algebra. And next is we want to uh, find some transformation uh, mechanism between the quantum observables and random uh, some classical property theory. And this is given by the spectral theory. Let you, let, let's just start by the some easy case, the finite dimensional case. And then we gave this uh, commutative quantum probability space on the finite dimensional uh, Hubert space. And just a remark that if we work on a finite dimensional case, the fundamental algebra is exactly like the star algebra. We don't need the, the strong closed and for the normal state, a state is enough. It's just a state is enough if it works on the finite dimensional case. Okay. And then we can obtain that exist a quantum, uh, sorry, a probability space, omega f and p. The, this is the sigma algebra and it is a probability mirror. And also we can obtain a star isomorphism, uh, the eta, between this um, star algebra to some bounded sequence on this one, on this space. So which means for, we can obtain this, this Yuta X is a classical random variable. And the probability, the measure is given by this question, which means that the measure is deduced from, from the state, okay. And we, we can just, uh, because we work on the finite dimensional Hilbert space, we can just uh, consider our space, it's a CN. Uh, of course, it's a finite number. And algebra, we can just uh, consider the, it's a commutative star algebra of a complex n times n matrix, okay. So we know that if the, the commuting uh, star algebra of the, or the n times n matrix, there always exists a unitary matrix U, which can diagonalize all the matrix in this site A at the same time. And then we define our omega at just the site of one to n. And if the sigma algebra, just the power, power site, okay. Power site, which means it's a, uh, all the subsite of omega. Now we define this u times x. Now the u times x is a run, is classical random variable between the omega to the c. Okay, by this one, by this definition, which means for each for the s for the s element, sorry, the output, I don't know the. The, the sorry the, the value yeah the value of u to x i is exactly the the s the i uh, eigenvalue of x okay and we can define the probability measure by this one which, which is just from the state on this on this the star algebra, okay. It's very easy, which means from now on we can see for any finite dimensional 
case on the finite dimension Hilbert space, the, the commutative quantum probability space is exactly equivalent to the classical uh, probability space. And next, we will generalize to the infinite dimensional case. And for the idea is exactly the same. We want to find some unitary operator which can diagonalize all the operators in this uh, fundamental algebra. Because we work on if we work on an infinite dimensional case, we need we need some fundamental algebra. And suppose let, let, let just suppose our Hilbert space be separable and A is a commutative fundamental algebra on this separable Hilbert space. There exists a finite major space, omega f and mu. Mu is a major on this space. And such u can diagonalize all the operators in this algebra at the same time. And then we can obtain a bounden, then we can obtain the bounden um, uh, random variable on such space. No, bounded function on such space, okay, acting as multiplication operator on the L2 space. I will not give the, the whole proof, but I will give just the outline of proof. And this outline I quoted from the studies of Van Handel studies. We just, because our Hilbert space is separable and A is committed to space, uh, there's a result that there always exist uh, bound and self adjunct operators belong, belonging to this uh, fundamental algebra A, such that this fundamental algebra is generated by this operator, self adjunct operator, okay? Which means we can always find A such that A equals to VNA. Uh, I think that this, maybe this result is the first approved by the fundamental that we can find the proof of the, this result in any classical book of the operator algebra. And next, of course, if, if this fundamental algebra is generated by the A, the, the self adjunct operator, this is always commutative, okay? And then we use the spectral theorem of the multiplication form. By, using, by applying this theorem on these self-adjunct operators, we can obtain that there always exists a finite major space, omega f and mu, so that uh, there exists also a bounded measurable function A on this function, uh, on this, this space, omega. And also there exists a unitary map between the H Hilbert space to the L2, to this space. And then we can write the U, A, U star, a just uh, application operator of A. Okay. And we can find this proof of the spectral theorem on the multiplication form in the Reed and Simon's book in the chapter here. Okay. And next, we want to define Another fundamental algebra, which is denoted by B, which is an abundant Borel function on this, this no spectrum, spectrum of the abundant operator A. Okay. And this one is a fundamental algebra. We can find the proof in this book. In this book. And next, we define just by using the functional calculus. Bounded Borel function of calculus, we can define a star isomorphism between this fundamental algebra and our, uh, our infinity, and the, this bounded function on this space. Then we can obtain uh, uh, application operator. Okay. And next, when you we just uh, can by using also the, this theorem in the result in this book. We can show this fundamental algebra B equals to the fundamental algebra of the original fundamental algebra, which means the, the, the 
proof is complete. But we, here we just work for the case, which means that each Hilbert space is always separable. Separable, but there are also some results on the Hilbert space named not separable, which we can find in the book of Sakai's book. But it's not our case. Uh, this result is already enough for our uh, final purpose. And here is a corollary, which is very crucial in our in this lecture. And we gave given this. Uh, commutative fundamental algebra and the normal state. And this is a commutative quantum properties on the separable H in the hyperspace. And there, is, there exists a finite major space. There exists a finite major space. The, the omega F and mu and the star isomorphism Utah between the A to the bounded bound function, numerable function. And we can also define the probability measure P, which is uh, absolutely continued by the mu, by, by the normal state for all the state, for all the operators in this algebra. And this is just the corollary of this theorem. So. Uh, we can see that. From this color is this color is I quoted from the the articles uh, the the uh, introduction to quantum field theory. Okay. And in fact, from this color is we can see that the any commutative probability space, so any commutative quantum probability space is equivalent to the classical probability space. And here, just a uh, little remark is we have already knew, but we, we have still introduced the probability measure P here because the mu, the mu is used to define the north site in this uh, sigma algebra. Because maybe uh, if, if there exists a projection P, for example, there exists a projection P in this fundamental algebra, and we have uh, the state of this projection equal to zero. And if we define the measure directly by, by the state, and will, of course, sorry, we have the U P is equal to zero also uh, as well. But we cannot to define the probability measure directly by the state, because if we define the measure directly by the state, it's not isomorphic, it's not, uh, inversible, okay? So we cannot uh, define a star isomorphism. This is why we add another P here. Okay, so until now, we have already uh, constructed the, the transformation, uh, transformation mechanism between the commutative probability space and the classical probability space. It's very nice, but that what we really worked on is always abundant, okay? It's always abundant operator. But it's not enough, just abundant operator. The real interesting observables in the quantum mechanics, a lot of cases is abundant observable. So we need also to deal with the abundant case. And here we will introduce a, a powerful tools to deal with this case, abundant case. Just give some notation and the hyperspace H and the pH, the site of orthogonal projection on this hyperspace. And we define a spectral measure. And there are some other definitions that call that the spectral projection or the projection valued measure is the same. I, I just took the name and the, the spectral measure. The Bohr R is a Bohr side of R, okay. And we define this one, the projection from the Borel site. Oh, sorry, there is a from Borel site to the projection to the whole set of projections uh, on the H, and it should satisfy. It's similar to the measure, okay, the definition of the measure, but this is a 
projection. So it, for the second one, it need to define the, the strong in the limit in the strong case in the strong sense. Uh, from the third, the third properties of condition, we can say that for any uh, for any subsite, the Bora subsite, the the, com the commute, which means the, the C E one and C E two commute with the C E two and C E one. Okay, and then I give the this powerful tool is called for no inverse spectral theory for any self adjunct operators on such space, Hilbert space, there exists a unique, there exists a unique spectral measure such that we can define, we can write uh, our self adjunct operators as in the ratio of the x in, with, with respect to the spectral measure. And also it's given any Borel function on R, okay, on R, uh, we have something, the functional calculus. And we denote this one by the fx. And the domain of this fx is given by this side. Very nice, so we have enough uh, tools to deal with the abundant observable. Okay. Here, in order to relate it, abundant observable, with uh, our quantum probability space, we introduce the notation of affiliated observable. The first of all, we suppose observable. Observable, I remark again, is self adjunct operators. Okay? Not necessarily bounded observables. On H, on hyperspace, has always the real spectrum. And we denote A as a fundamental algebra. If an observable is affiliated to the fundamental algebra A, and we denote it by the x, the eta A, okay? And if the spectrum of this self adjunct operators for any Borel subsite belong to this, this fundamental algebra, then we call such self adjunct operator is affiliated to the fundamental algebra. And in fact, this definition is not the common one, it's not the, the common definition, like the algebraic uh, one. But we can find the, the proof for, to show the equivalence between this, this uh, I prefer to call that as a probabilistic definition, is, is equivalent to the algebraic one. And uh, some detailed discussion on this point can be found in the Mears book, the Paulo Paulo Mears book. Because why I prefer this one, it's very close to the definition of the measurable from the classical measurable function. Okay, it's very, so I, I prefer this one for the, uh, I prefer this one and the probabilistic definition of affiliated operator. And we have already gave the definition from the fundamental algebra generated by a bounded operator or the bounded site. But here I will give the fundamental algebra generated by unbounded self adjunct operator, which is generated by the set all the, the set of a spectrum major. Okay. Spectrum major, which is a projection of course is bounded. Then which means this this is well defined. And uh, as I said from these properties, for any two projections, for any two spectrum measure is always commutative. Uh, this site is commutative. So the fundamental algebra generated by this site is a commutative fundamental algebra. And next is, let's return back to the bounded case. For any bounded operator, uh, sorry, from the bounded operator X, a self adjunct operator X. If it is X is affiliated to the A, I can show the equivalence between the affiliated, which means this X is belong, belongs to the A. And for this equivalence, it can be found, the proof for this equivalent can, can be found in this book. 
and next is we have already said that the for the bounded operator the fundamental algebra generated by the x is by using the double commit technique double commit technique we can also we can also show that this one for the bounded operator case is exactly the same but in this case which means they generated by, by his spectrum major. We can show that it is trivial. So, and of course, for any operators, of course, it's affiliated to, to the fundamental algebra generated by, by itself. This is also very trivial. I just uh, make it as a remark. Okay. We have already defined the affiliated, the sum, the counterpart of the measurable, the quantum analog of the measurable function. And next is how to extend our definition of the, uh, the magic star isomorphism from the abundant case to the abundant case. Because before, the, our spectral theorem is always on the abundant case. Okay? And next, we, we only consider the case for the uh, observable x, observable self adjoint operator uh, affiliated to the community, community fundamental algebra. And I said in the offline proof of the spectral theorem, for any community fundamental algebra, there is always exist the abundant uh, self adjoint operators belong to this, this algebra, so that this algebra is equal to the, the VNA. And next, this is maybe unbounded. We will just consider unbounded the self general operator x, and we can show that the, this inverse is always bounded. Okay, and belong to the VNA because our x is affiliated to the to the fundamental algebra, committed to fundamental algebra A, and affiliated, which means all the spectral measure belongs to this fundamental algebra, and of course we, we this. This function, uh, sorry, this this inverse also belongs to this fundamental algebra, and for the proof, uh, the inverse is bounded. It also can be found in the uh, Rida Simon's book. It's not difficult to show that. So, if this operator is bounded, we return back to the case on the bounded case. So we can just find, and then moreover, uh, this one belongs to also belongs to the fundamental algebra and its community for the algebra, which means the A community with, with the, the operator community with, with this operator, which means they can share a same unitary operators and we can obtain the star isomorphism for, for this inverse. Okay. And next we just follow the same procedure uh, the spectral theorem of the multiplication multiplication form for the unbounded operator, which also can be found in the Rita Simon's book. And we define uh, and the, here it's a, it's a random variable by this one. Okay. I mean the for this one for the bounded, the uta of the inverse is well defined because it's bounded. So we can define for, for this one a discretion. And note that for this function, it's a mu almost surely finite measurable random variable on the omega. So nice, we have already extended our uh, star isomorphism to the unbounded case, self adjunct case. But we still need to define some multiplication and additions. Because if for the bounded case, we don't have the domain issue, don't have the domain problem. But if for the unbounded case, and each time we want to do some multiplication operations for the unbounded operator, we need to, to take care of the domain. But there's a very important result in this book, in the chapter five, I think, of this book. You see that if for any site, uh, sorry, for the, uh, there's a site. I just, uh, the, 
we denote the set of all self-adjoint operators affiliated to the commutative. The A is a commutative fundamental algebra. For the site of all self-adjoint operators affiliated to the commutative fundamental algebra, A denoted by this SA. And for there is a very important result is for any X and Y affiliated to the commutative fundamental algebra A, we define the plus hat by the closure, by the closure of the X plus Y. And the uh, the height of the point, height point, okay, height point, also by the closure. And these two operators are self-adjoint and they're affiliated to this community from the algebra A as well. So, the, as you know, we can show that the site of all self-adjoint operators affiliated to the fundamental algebra, community from the algebra A, SA, forms a commutative star algebra with a unit identity under the height plus and height uh, the point. And then we can just extend our star isomorphism by applying the spectral theorem on this A. We can extend this isomorphism to an isomorphism between the SA, the set of all observables affiliated to the A, and the set of new, almost surely finite, measurable random variables on omega. Okay, but maybe it's not, still not enough for our final purpose. We still need some more general case of unbound operator. And here I will extend, generalize the, oh, sorry, generalize this case, the self adjunct case to the normal case. And I will uh, denote A as a commutative fundamental algebra. And we, we apply the spectral theorem on A and obtain the star isomorphism, Uta. And then we denote the set of all normal observables, uh, sorry, normal operators affiliated to the A by the NA normal affiliated to A, okay. And here, sorry, I give the normal definition, I give two definitions. And if a closed and a density defined operator, X is normal, if these two, is two operators, are self adjoint and commute with each other. I know this is not the, the common definition for the normal operators, but we can find the equivalent, the proof for the equivalence in this book. I just use this definition because we have already defined the, the, the head plus uh, is more coherent with, with our definition before. So I choose this one as a definition for the normal. And for the second definition is normal operators, X is affiliated to the A. We have already said that for any self-adjoint operator is affiliated if a spectral major belongs to the, this algebra. And then for the, if we, we can extend this definition to the normal operators, if a normal operator X is affiliated to A, if this two part, self so just part of the normal operators are affiliated to the A. Okay, uh, and a similar result, we can extend our result to the normal case. Firstly, it's a set of all normal operators affiliated to A forms a commutative star algebra under the head plus and head point. The second one is we can extend the star isomorphism by applying the spectral theorem on this uh, algebra to an isomorphism between the NA and the set of you know, almost surely finite major random variable on the omega. Now, you know, we have already finished our framework for the quantum, quantum, quantum uh, system. Uh, I mean, maybe it's not the general, it's not the general one, but it's already enough for our final purpose to derive uh, quantum future in theory. And I'll give an example to apply our 
counterparty theory is, I suppose, for the uh, shooting picture on the short, uh, short space, okay, the position operator and the momentum operator. And the P and Q are the, we define as the closure of these two operators, and then we can show that the P and the Q are self-adjoint. Next, we define a state. It's a pure state, it's just a vector state. On this algebra, on this algebra, so our quantum space, our quantum probability space is given by this one, this fundamental algebra, and the state. State is given by this, okay, this vector is deduced from this vector on the Hilbert space. And next is for the any Q, its operators, and the spectral measure is just, it's just the identity, I mean, the not identity is a multiplication operator of identity on the, on this Borel subsite. Okay, which means for, for this one is already diagonalized. It's already in the diagonal uh, diagonal form. It's, we don't need to to apply the spectral theorem. It's already have uh, very good properties, and then the fundamental algebra uh, generated by this uh, by this operator is the whole bounded operator, uh, the whole bounded function on R. And then we we can show that the property measure for the probability probability for the this so for, for the uta q now uta q is a random variable the classical random variable we suppose for this event this uta q belong to this uh, borel subsite it's given by this one okay it's our definition from the spectral theorem we, we, we can write in the integral form, okay, because we choose this as a, as a special in a special form, we choose the, the for x in a special form. So now we can see that from this expression, it, def it defines a Gaussian major, okay, which means now our uh, random variable is exactly the, the Gaussian random variable. Because x and the q and p is bounded, it's, sorry, it's unbounded. There are also a technique. We can transform it to some bounded case. Of course, it's in the bounded case, it's much more easier to calculate. We can calculate uh, its capital function. Which means now we, we calculate the uta e i t q. Okay, it's bounded, so it's much more easy. We can apply. Uh, the spectral term directly, and uh, the, the 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 see the state is always the same one. It's always the same, and we can obtain just by straightforward calculation, and we can obtain the 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 characteristic function for this one and this one given by these two functions. Okay, it's, so it, we can see that these two function. It's a random, uh, sorry, it's a Gaussian, Gaussian random variable. Okay, we have already finished the, the construct of the quantum uh, probability theory. Uh, but next, we need to general, generalize a little bit to, to define some a quantum stochastic precise. And here we just define the two special precise, which can, we'll use it lately, which can describe the, the field, the quantum bosonic field. Okay. And the main reference is the book of Pathasarthi, an introduction to the quantum stochastic calculus. Okay. And I, I will also need to define some definition of notation. The first one is the focus space. Uh, for any in the H, we define the first for on the hyperspace H for any vector. Then in H, we define the symmetric product uh, denoted by the circle. 
okay? And uh, such uh, action or the operation defined by this expression, where the PN as a perturbation group, permutation group on the N element. And then we define this space by the close, the subspace, uh, the N times tensor product of the hyperspace generated by the all vectors of the uh, U1 circles to UN. And here we can also define the two, the scalar products on the these two space. Okay, next. That's a very important definition is a symmetric focus space. A symmetric focus space sometimes is also called the bosonic focus space. Over the H, the hyperspace, and this hyperspace is called the single, the single particle hyperspace. And we denote the symmetric focus space by the gamma S. Okay, S means symmetric. And H and the associate single particle hyperspace. Here's the definition. And also there's a remark is if the single particle hyperspace is separable, uh, our symmetric focus space is also a separable hyperspace. And to study, to study the maybe in the quantum field, the, there will appear some unbound observables. And the technique proposed by the Husen and uh, pa Parsarasi is they define uh, some, they, they try to store this in uh, the dense, dense subsite of the Huber space. And this subsite is called exponential domain. Uh, firstly, we will define the exponential vectors, EU, and U is a vector in the particle, in the particle, single particle Hilbert space. Here's a definition, and it's also a, a vector in the bosonic Hilbert space, uh, in the bosonic focus space, uh, symmetric focus space. And next is an important notation is we call the vacuum state, a uh, vacuum vector by the E0, which means the first, okay, the first is one, and next is O0, vacuum vector. And here is some, it's a, which we can calculate directly, in fact. And I just gave an expression of calculating the, the, the inner product of these two uh, exponential vectors. And I, maybe it's a little bit misleading because for this inner product, it's on this space, on this Hilbert space, on the focus space. But for the last one, it's on the single, it's on, on the H. So I just, uh, I just, I don't, I, I didn't write the, the notation because it, I think it's enough. We can understand that. Okay, here's the expression to calculate the inner product between the two exponential vectors. And then we just denote the linear spine of all the exponential vectors and the capital E H. And this space stands in the focus space. And each one, each uh, exponential vectors generate the exponential domain are linearly independent. All this information, all this uh, definition we can find in this book, as particularly an introduction to the quantum stochastic calculus. And here, it's an important theorem. It's a stone theorem, which can help us to construct the, the quantum stochastic process. And firstly, I gave the definition of a strongly continuous one parameter uni unitary group. This is the operator valued function ut on the on the space on the Hilbert space H. It is called strongly continuous one parameter unit group if it is satisfied two properties. The first one is a group property. Okay. This is a group property. And the second one is strong continuity. This is just the common definition. And for, for any 
strongly continues the one parameter unitary group, UT. And there exists a self adjoint operator A on this space, hyperspace, such that we can write the UT equals to exponential ITA. Okay. So A is a self adjoint operator. So okay. Okay, next is for any two. Why far they the okay for any two vectors on the hyperspace uh, given a unitary operator u on this hyperspace, there exist a unique unitary operators. It's called well operators. I denoted by the W u and capital u on this super, uh, on this focal space okay and now for the single particle hyperspace uh, denoted by uh, i choose this one l2 on the the half the positive half of the real line as our single particle hyperspace and it's acting like that on the exponential vector and this operation. And this theorem can be found in this book. And also we have this one. This one is also called the well, the well relation. Okay, well relation. And in fact, sorry, in fact, from the, this expression, we can see that the there's two uh, the, the vector u are uh, the unitary operator, the capital U. After we apply the, the well operated on these exponential vectors, we can see that the capital U acts as a rotation, okay, rotation, and the small u as a translation. We have also this expression. And if we choose the u, u1, uh, sorry, if we choose the, the this this to the vector as the u, and we choose the, these unitary operators as the identities, and we define such our uh, well operator as the, just the u. Okay. And next is if we choose the there's no which means the first one is only there's no rotation it's only translation for the first operator. This one and the first second one there is no translation but just the rotation we just rotate the, the the state. We define this one by gamma, gamma u. Uh, let's just uh, first uh, focus on the translation group by the vector u. From the well relation, we have these two properties. Okay, and we can see that from the second one, it's very important. From the second one, it's uh, if this two, if the inner product of the u and v is a real one, which means the well operator is commutative and commute between these two, okay? If this inner product is a real. And then we can justify this one, we can obtain this relation, which means that the well operator satisfy the group property. And it's also, we can show the strong continuity of this, uh, of the well operators. And the proof of this, the, the strong continuity can be found in, also in this book, in this proposition. So, our well operator WTE forms a one parameter strong unitary, a strongly continuous unitary group. And next, we just apply the stone theorem. We apply the stone theorem on this on this one parameter strong a continuous unitary group. Uh, we can obtain this information. We can obtain this expression, which means we can this this B U is a self adjoint operator. They exist. Is self adjoint operator, and we call this this operator and a field operator. Okay. 
And we can also show that from this one, from the well relation. We've already said that if the inner product between the U and V is a real, and these two well operators commute. And this, if these two, if these two operators commute, for the exponent, for exponent in the field operator, and the commute also. And the proof, for example, we can find in the read and Simon book for this result. And next, and here we have already defined the field operator, a field operator. And next, we focus on the rotation group by the unitary operators by U. The cut U. Just from there is the, from this relation, from this relation, we can define the, the gamma U, the action the gamma U on this exponential vectors with this one, which means that we can obtain this relation. Okay, it's very uh, it's obvious. And of course, if U and V commute, we know that the, the, the gamma U and the gamma V commute. And uh, we gave, we're given uh, unitary R, the given uh, one parameter strongly continuous unitary group, UT, there is A, uh, uh, self joint operator, and we define another one parameter strongly continuous unitary group on, the, on this focus space, and denote the, this, this group by the, the gamma UT. Okay, because this is also, uh, the stronger continuous, continuous. We just apply uh, once again the Stone theorem on this group, and we can obtain we can obtain this expression. This expression and the I just denoted as the lambda a, and lambda a is a self-adjunct operator which is called differential second condensation of A. And by the same reason, if this two, if A1 and A2 commute, we have these two, uh, these two operators, self adjunct operators commute. Okay, so until now we have defined the two operators, important operators. One is field operator. Another one is a differential. This operator is called differential second condensation of A. Okay, now I will give, give a definition for the three fundamental stochastic precise. The first the one, uh, sorry, the first, I define the, the two quadratures, the defined quadratures by the field operator. Okay, the field operator, field operator is here, field operator, and the QT is by this one, which means that I choose this, uh, in the Huber space, this factor in the Huber space, and the second one, the PT, and just the negative. So we can say that for the each T, we just focus on each one. For the QT is always commute with another S. For example, the QT commute always with the QS. And the PT is the same. The PT commute with PS. But the QT and the PT doesn't commute with each other. And we also give the definition of the gauge precise. It's given by the, the differential second condensation by these operators. And the, we define by the gamma, a lambda, sorry, lambda, the multiplication operators of the, this identity, not identity, by this constant. Okay. This, this multiplication operators is defined by this action on the L2. And we can see that for this gate precise, the lambda t commute with lambda s. But, so I have this remark, for the qt, pt, and lambda t are commutative, but they don't commute with each other. And next, we give the federation for this three fundamental stochastic precise, the quantum stochastic precise. It's just the fundamental algebra generated 
by these three precise on two times t. Okay, because as I said, this, the three are commutative. For so for the three from the algebra, a commutative from the algebra, which means, as our spectral theorem, the three from the algebra we can we can construct the three commutative uh, quantum probability space, and which are equivalent to the three different classical uh, three different classical uh, probability space. And next, we, we, we give some, so we define some state on each uh, fundamental algebra. The first one we call that the vacuum state, which induced from the vacuum vectors E0. And then for the second one, we call that coherent state. It, it's just the translation, we will translate uh, vacuum vectors by, by a vector F. Okay. And then just by the direct calculation, we can obtain this expression. And we define the three commutative co uh, constant probability space. And next, what we want to do is we just apply the spectral theorem on the three commutative uh, probability space. And the first is we can obtain that for these two uh, classical random, uh, classical stochastic precise, are linear precise in the vacuum state, in the vacuum state. Okay. And I will just give the proof for the first one, and for the second one is exactly the same thing. What we will do is we, we define the chart characteristic function of these two increments. Okay. And then, we calculate the expectation, and next uh, which uh, we translate to the in the quantum case, it can can be calculated by the the, uh, the inner product with the vacuum vector. By just the straightforward calculation, we can obtain finally we can obtain this one, which means from this expression, which we we can see that the QT okay has independent increments. And for the each increment, it's Gaussian, it's a Gaussian random variable. And now we have already almost sure that this precise, the classical precise, uh, stochastic precise is a linear precise. But we need, still need some, some continuous uh, properties. In fact, we, we cannot show that it is continuous because for the each uh, instant, uh, we can always choose the, 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 the version that, such that they cannot be, be continuous. But by using the common growth continuity theory, we can show that there is always exists a continuous modification of this stochastic precise. And for the theorem can be found in any classical stochastic book, for example, uh, in the, Mark York's book, Mark York and Hervey's book. So until now we have already finished that uh, the, the first stochastic precise is a linear precise in the vacuum state. Okay. And next, we see that for this precise, we first started this stochastic precise in the vacuum state. In the vacuum state, and we can see that it's a little bit boring because it is always zero, it is not interesting. But if we started in this precise in the coherent state, in a coherent state, we can show that this, this stochastic precise is a Poisson precise. For the first one, uh, because this expression right, is very easy to show that we just we can obtain this precise uh, because the, the gamma u uh, applied on the, this at, on, on, the, on the vacuum state is still vacuum state which means that the exponent is almost surely zero in the vacuum state okay next exponent of uh, this the, this operator 
And next, we do the same thing, which means we define the job characteristic function of these two increments uh, just by the straightforward calculation that a little bit long. And finally, we can obtain this expression. We can obtain this, this expression, which means for this precise, we have the independent increments. And for the each increment, it's a Poisson random variable. With the, then for this stochastic precise, we can show that in the covariant state, it's a Poisson precise with a time dependent intensity. It's given by this one, Ft, Ft squared. Why it is interesting to, to analyze it, this three precise? Because in the, for example, in quantum optics, for the first two precise, the QT and PT can be observed by using a homodyne detector to measure the vacuum state. And for the, the, the proton precise can be measured by a photon counter. And in the following, in the following lecture though, we will always focus on the first one, which means we will always suppose our system, and our field is observed by the homodyne detector. And the photon, uh, mathematical explanation of these two measurements can be found in the lecture note of the Bartley. Okay, I think it's... Yeah. So I think we stop here today. Do you have any question or the comments? So anybody, any questions, any comments? I think there are some technical issues with the notes, but they're minor. I, I found it very clear, but uh, I don't know how other people have found it, but there are some technical issues. There are certain things that, I, uh, but do you agree, Cladala? Hello. Kind of, Any question? Uh, no, I mean, there, there, yeah. were, there were certain purely technical things that I think when you copy from the book, you copy quite quickly, <laughs> to be honest, but they're mine. Uh, they're minor, so I mean, I don't know whether anybody who knows well this stuff would be willing to go through the notes and kind of, or, or if I find time to do so. Hey, it's just a minor correction that appear here and there, kind of when you define x plus y bar, what is x plus y? When you define, what is x plus y? Kind of, you have to, what do you mean by that? When you define this normal operator since there were the, the certain terminology issues, but this is all minor. It's all minor. Uh, I, I find it overall very good. I don't know how they got it. Yeah, we, I would just ask a question. Uh, uh, I think it would be interesting to uh, to have more details on the last minor, slide. Uh, but, uh, do you hear me? Yeah. Uh, but we don't hear you so well, Armen, actually. Uh, you, is everybody hearing our man well or it's only me? No, it, it's not a good connection. Yeah. Uh, but it seems like we're hearing him through Wai Chao's microphone and not his own. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> uh, um. Okay, so Kodalan has a, a question, right? Oh my God. So, you don't hear me? We hear you perfectly well. We don't hear our man. Ah. Ah. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Hello. We hear you perfectly well. Oh, okay, 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 perfect. It's my, it's my problem with the computer. I think it is only issue with our man. We don't hear our man, but uh, uh, maybe, maybe our man can type uh, what you want to say in the chat. Yeah. Okay, I mean, uh, Jan, could you, could you come back to your last slide? Yeah, last slide. Okay. Uh, I think that I have two questions there. Uh, the first. Uh, excuse me, I just. Uh, yeah, show my screen. Uh, Last, this one. Maybe it would be good to have uh, 
to have uh, uh, some idea about what it means uh, homodyne detector. I know what the photon counter is, but I never, I was never able to understand what an homodyne detector is. And also, maybe it would be nice to have a physical picture about. about yeah, yeah. I will show you this. Uh, what what do they mean in in quantum optics? And uh, yeah. okay, uh, I still just to find it. Uh, the picture. Wait a moment. Uh, yeah, I have the physical picture in fact. Uh, uh, sorry, is it sharing or no? It's not, no, 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 Can you see the picture? Yeah. Yeah, okay. This is, in fact, I'm not very sure I can, I know, it, I'm not, no, I, I don't know it very well, but the homodyne detector is something like that. It, in fact, it's just a composed of two uh, photon uh, photon counter uh, photon counter. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, yeah. Sorry. With a differential. What is that? Uh, something which counts the difference of the two signal or what? Uh, in fact, uh, I'm sorry. I, I don't know very well the the physical. Uh, uh -huh. of that. But what I know is, I try to discuss uh, these things with a friend who's uh, experimented, uh, use a lot of th th these things. But they told me it's something very like to the, close to the telecommunication. Uh, we have two, the photon detectors, and there is also the, the local oscillators, the also local uh, oscillators, something like that. And we can just uh, uh, buy the song. Uh, sorry, I... I I don't know it very well. I, uh, I will make some research and maybe we can discuss it later. So there is a piece of physics here to understand and so kind of, so Tristan, can you tell us what's going on with that director? Okay. I, I, I'm not uh, comp uh, really an expert, but from what I read and like you can find, I guess, in the uh, Weizmann uh, Milburn book also that Basically, homodyne and heterodyne, the difference is that uh, if you are, um, is the laser you use here in blue is in sync with uh, the, the oscillation of your spin. And uh, what you do when you do homodyne, homodyne de detector is that, so you have one of uh, the arm here of your um, interferometer uh, that doesn't see the spin, and then you compare as uh, the phase between the two arms of uh, the, the interferometer. And so you have like a, a huge amount of uh, photon coming in into your detector. So what actually you see is some dephasing between uh, a signal that co corresponds to what you obtain as the dephasing uh, in between the two arms of the detector. And that is what I understood. But what I don't understand in this picture is, I mean, it seems like, you know, the laser goes, I mean, you know, this, I mean, I have, I have this cavity, which is supposed to be coated by mirrors. So, yeah. And, and the laser, the laser seems to be, to go through the mirrors. So that I don't understand. I mean. Uh, yeah, I never saw it like that. Like it, what I saw more was okay. It's that you have a laser or electromagnetic cavity interacting with uh, an ion or like uh, either like two le two level atom, so ions or artificial yeah. atom like uh, Josephson junction, and then it's in. But how do you monitor the field? That's that's the point. I mean. So the field. Uh, so you monitor you you really measure the current of photons coming out of uh, the, the um, measure of the two, the two arms of your interferometer. Oh. So you, you have your laser coming in and you split in two with a beam splitter 
one of the arm of the interferometer sees the atom yeah. and is uh, perturbed by its interaction uh, with the atom. And then you merge the two signals and you measure I the current coming out. But, but what I don't understand is the configuration. I mean, I mean, you have this cavity, and so 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 where does where does the where does the laser beam enter the cavity? So if you so you shouldn't think uh, like a Roche experiment. Uh, so either you have ion traps, so then you can shine the, ah, yeah, the laser directly on the atom. Mirrors, you mean? This is sorry. You have no mirror, then. You yeah, you have, have no mirror. It's have like a just electromagnetic uh, sustentation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And if you have mirror, it comes from the side, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, so that was, I, I am even more basic in not understanding. So, so basically, you have these two Brownian motions, classical Brownian motions, I P of T and I Q of two, that are observed somewhere. Uh, sorry. There are two classical Brownian motions. Yeah. That you supposed to measure from the detector and where they are. And of course, there will be some correlations between them in principle, but that's a different story. We didn't, we didn't discuss that. But, uh, but uh, so they're completely classical right now. Mm -hmm. And then you see, but how do you distinguish them where they are seen in this detection? Because you go to position and momentum, so to speak, your e of power of t and i of q of 2. Where do you, where do you see them in this detection? Uh, where, uh, in fact, uh, in fact, what we real measure is not uh, the the IQT or the IPT. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's not that one. Uh, uh, is uh, what we really measured is just the uh, IQT. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, wait a moment. Uh, Maybe it's just the I. It's just the uh, sorry. It's just the QT. Maybe it's just the IQT. What do we really made it? Because after the 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 output of this homodyne detector, it, it's a classical signal. In fact, but IP classical. of T is also classical. Sorry. IP of T is also classical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the uh, it's just the, the classical. Uh, that's not that's not the reason. But it doesn't matter, kind of. So I mean, the, I'm not the, really sure about this. Yeah. this thing. But are, are you familiar, Tristan or, or Francesco? Kind of, you have these two Brownian motions, and they're supposed somehow to be measured. And of course, there will, there will be some correlations between the measurements because P of two and Q of two do not do not commute. But okay, that is interesting. Mm -hmm. But uh, how do you measure, and what is that supposed to mean, actually? You mean. From what yeah. I know, is that you cannot measure both at the same time, of course, because they do not commute. So yeah, yeah of course. Point. Yeah. And uh, so you have to choose, uh, like P and Q, they are called quadrature of the field. And you have actually many more than that, like basically any uh, unitary combination of creation and annihilation operator is completely okay. So if you do a rotation between Q and, and P, you still get a quadrature that you can, use, you can measure. And uh, so basically, it's I mean, for Q and P, maybe it would be like um, uh, the easiest way to see it would be that if you are in a vacuum, you don't have any atom, and you shine a laser to towards your uh, to, towards your detector, and what you, the noise you will see is uh, Q T and P T. Okay. When the laser is really strong. So basically, yeah. there is some implicit semi-classical limit here from going from quantum to classical that this process is supposed to describe automatically. The easiest way to see it uh, from a physical point of view is because it is to see it when you have uh, this laser that is so um, intense that you cannot distinguish each photon individually. You have to, you have to, to see only a current of photons and then the quadrature emerge from that. And you have like you can actually do the limit from this limit. Yeah, so this is of course harmonic oscillator, so kind of does not really matter, kind of. Yeah. There is no real semi classics, but uh, but in principle, I guess when you be okay, I, I, we don't know, so we'll see.
Okay, so Francesco, you're an expert. Do you have any comments? Well, um, my understanding of this part, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, sorry, I'm on the phone because I had another meeting before and I'm away from the office. So anyway, uh, my understanding, uh, if you can go back to the picture uh, of the homodyne detection setup, is well, that basically um, you, the, the cavity in which the spin is trapped is very weakly leaking photons and so basically that's assumed to be your vacuum state and you're, you're homodyne detecting that. So you're expecting to see a signal which is uh, equivalent to or practically equivalent to, to Wiener noise fluctuation because you're measuring the Q from that vacuum state. You're using this setup. And what happens is that when you actually see something that's different, like an anomaly in the uh, statistics of that signal, it means that, for example, that the spin has, uh, or whatever the atom inside the cavity has released a photon or something like that. And you use that to inter to, through the filtering equation to infer a change of state in the system in the cavity. Very so, thank, thanks. Uh, that, that was very clear. Yeah. Um, maybe maybe Wei Chao can do a little bit more of an introduction next time about this bit, but I think it's it's very um, crucial to connect the experiment, the typical experiment setup in, and the measurement setup to understand what we're doing next. Exactly. Because yeah. otherwise the, the, the classical noise that we put in the filtering equation um, kind of uh, has a very strong information theoretic interpretation, but not so much a physical interpretation. As a control engineer, very, very often we are happy with the first and we don't dig too much into the physical details if we trust the physicist that give, gives the model to us. But he has done such a thorough job in explaining how these models are derived that I think it's worth to connect the dots here. Um, anyway, I think in a picture like that, uh, regarding to Claude Alain question, the basically you are expecting to see nothing coming from the, from the spin, from the system, and that's the vacuum state you're monitoring. And, and if you monitor the vacuum, you get fluctuations, which are distributed as a Wiener process. And then when you see something, you can use that to update your state. That's the general idea I, mm. I have in mind. Mm. So okay, it's, so it's basically like um, it's basically like a Wiener noise masking a a, 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 a jump process behind it. Mm. Mm. So but, that, that's good idea. Okay, thank you. That's quite ingenious and a little bit different than from what we heard from HR five minutes ago. So 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 it's uh, okay okay so. So, but I think you're absolutely right because one goal of us, I mean, at least that is a rough idea, is to actually connect both physics and control part on equal terms and so to, to mm -hmm. understand those things. That, that was the original idea of, of what, what we are trying to do. So, so basically, Claude Alain nailed it down. I mean, one really has to understand this, uh, this thing. But I mean, I, I, I'm not sure the HR, the HR background is good enough for that. I mean, uh, I mean but I don't, don't want to bother, bother Tristan too much. Tristan, would you be willing to explain this to us? In principle? So, uh, uh, yeah, to explain what exactly? Well, kind of how, how that, how that uh, I mean, kind of, uh, he gave a pretty clear picture, uh, uh, Francesco, but we kind of would like to hear more detail. I mean, how does these experiments really actually work and kind of what is the physics background behind that kind of, you know? Um. Okay, I think the best example of that is, uh, is the experiment of uh, Benjamin Huard group. So basically what they have is that they have inside a cavity that is connected to some uh, electromagnetic uh, channels. Uh, they have an artificial atom, so transmond qubit, like this, this is kind of a Josephson uh, junction. 
And they, so in, what they do actually is that they send wave packet of lights using their different uh, channels like fiber optics. And then they measure the current they get uh, coming out, the current of photon. And what they measure and what they have as a data is the current of photons coming out, of a light coming out, the intensity of it. And that's what they, what they measure. It's just like, like you measure, or in other experiments, what they will measure is a current, electric current coming out. And, they, and what you see, what they, they saw in one of the articles they did actually uh, in uh, UR group, is to show that actually quantum trajectories describe well the evolution of the system. And that indeed it's with diffusion. That's okay, the current, you can modelize it by this. Uh, okay, it's not this, um, this Brownian motion because of course you have this interaction with the atoms that creates some kind of non-commutative, uh, um, sorry, uh, Gersanov transform, but if you get, rid of it, you, what you should see, if you get rid of the atom, what you should see is just it's this uh, Brownian motion. I, I can find back the, the reference if you want. And so this Brownian motion is basically telling you according to Francesco properties of the, of the particles entering into the cavity. Yeah, yeah, it, it's basically what, it's a natural noise of the cavity, basically, because when you, your cavity is in the vacuum, and when you try to measure uh, the field operator on it, of course, it's not, uh, the vacuum is not an eigenvector of uh, this operator. So necessarily, uh, you won't get like zero, you won't get nothing, you will get a noise. Like when you measure the position of an harmonic oscillator when it's in its fundamental uh, state, it's not the position, it's a random position, which is Gaussian. It's exactly the same thing. But now, now Francesco told us you get nothing and you tell us you be got, be get noise, that's different. Huh? No, I mean, you get, okay. I don't know what you meant by nothing, uh, Francesco, but it's, okay, you expect you will get uh, nothing in classical physics, but actually in quantum physics, what you get is the position of the harmonic oscillator in its fundamental state, which is a Gaussian uh, random variable. Yeah, I mean, you get, you get nothing in terms of uh, information of what's going on really on in the spin yeah. system, sorry. But you do, you do get only noise fluctuation. Ah, okay, that's okay. And then, and then when something enters, there are fluctuations and there's fluctuations. You learn from, about, from those fluctuations, you learn about the particles that enter to the system. Is so what, what happens is that, so you have this fundamental uh, oscillation, uh, um, uh, randomness of your harmonic oscillator. Uh, if you think of, basically you can think of the noise as one of harmonic oscillator at each point in time. Okay. It's completely singular and not well defined in mathematically, but you can think of it like that. And then what happens, so if you measure it directly without anything else uh, interacting, you just see an harmonic oscillator, so you, you see a Gaussian. But if you, if you add an interaction with a spin, it will modify, like a Gersanov transformation, it will modify your uh, Gaussian so it will modify your one motion by adding a, a drift to it. And the drift depends on the state of the spin. And that way, since you still measure the, the same uh, random variable, but with a different uh, law, the drift you find in this uh, noise now gives you some information about the state of the spin. Excellent. So uh, this is okay with everybody? Mm -hmm. now, the, now another question. So in this process, you want to learn what? You want to learn about the particle coming in or you want to learn about uh, what is inside of the cavity? It, it looks to me you're learning that this is orthogonal to Harosh experiment. Is it correct? Uh, in fact, what well, I, the, this, this part I just introduced at the Tristan side, uh, if we measure nothing, which means it's vacuum, we can obtain the we can, which means that we can obtain the the Brownian motion. But next, this is just the first part I want to introduce the 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 phenomenon we just the field. And next, uh, in the next lecture, I will introduce the the, the interaction model give give them the the model of interaction. Just like the Tristan said, if we want to, in fact, we want to measure the the spin. For example, here it's a spin system, but what we really measured by the field is not if there is some interaction between the, the, 
the spin and the field, we cannot uh, obtain the Brownian motion. Again, uh, we can another precise, look at precise, but it contains some information on, on this part, on, on this distance. And this is what I want to introduce in the next lecture. And this is part, yeah. So um, I'm going to make, uh, if I can, a last comment, and then I have to leave for another meeting. But um, with this setup in the slide with respect to a rush setup, are equivalent in principle, but the role of the photons and the spins is, is reversed in some sense. In the sense that he's shooting spins inside a cavity to control the number of photons in the cavity and uses this, the monitoring of the spins in order to know what's going on in the cavity. This is the older Mabuchi setup where he's sending photons in, inside the cavity where he has a cloud of cold spins and he uses the fluctuation in the photon statistics in order to learn what's happening to the spin. The spins are trapped inside the cavity here. In a rush system, the spins travel through the cavity. So, so in, in, in either case, you're interested to learn about the field? Um, no. Well, in, in a Roche system, you're, you're, you're interested in learning how many photons you have in the cavity, pretty much. So you're, you're learning about the field. The target is the field, and you're monitoring the spin. In oh. this system, you are monitoring the field, but your ultimate interest is reconstructing the density operator of the spin. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. I'm sorry for the... Um, Rush goodbye, and I'll see you next week. Uh, let me know if there's material that uh, I should produce in order to um, make some parts clearer about this. Yeah. Thank you very much, Wei Chao. Thank you, everybody. Welcome. Anybody else get any questions? Okay. Okay, so kind of, uh, so I mean, uh, as an introduction to, I mean, uh, I mean, that, as, as I find there are certain technical issues, but they're typically minor. And, uh, and I think for people who are not familiar with quantum probability, this is actually an, quite an excellent introduction to kind of look, I mean, it's not technically very hard. It's basically function, basic functional analysis. And uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a good thing for people to, not who have not seen that before, kind of for the students, I guess, to learn by, by reading the virtual slides. So, so it's, I, don't, I don't know. What do you think, Lodama? Kind of? I think it was quite clear. Yeah, yeah, I think it was quite good. Yeah. Uh, as you said, I mean, maybe, maybe people not, uh, not acquainted with the subject should go a little bit further in technology into technical details, but I think as an introduction, it was quite good, yes, yes. That's excellent, so, yeah, so then, uh, anything, I mean, that I, then, thank you, Wei Chao, and then I guess we continue next week, huh? Okay, you're welcome. Thank you, Wei Chao. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. Okay, okay. Bye. Good to get in touch, bye. Bye. Yeah. Okay.